Entrepreneurs are usually described uh, as individuals with different minds. On the other hand, corporates are described as institutions and people that do not have such a mind. But in the following panel, uh, the distinguished speakers will try to give an answer what can be the role of corporate? Can the corporates make a bridge uh, between angel investments and venture capital? The panel number seven, the role of corporates in supporting angel-backed businesses to achieve global growth, working with corporates to boost startup potential and to accelerate globalization companies. Top name and And I would like to ask April Johnson, lecturer from the Copenhagen Business School, Denmark. When Clark uh, asked me to excuse him, he had to leave, unfortunately. Nikhil Agarwal, Senior Advisor from Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Welcome. That's what the next time is. That's the right. That's the right. That's the right. That's the right. And the moderator of the panel, Paolo Andres, Emeritus President, Ivan coming from Portugal. So I'm not Sidman, I'm not Sidman, yes, of course. Thank you for coming. I imagine that 90% of you are here because you are our friends. So thank you for <laughs> It's the way that we, we keep people. Um, so this uh, panel will talk about the, the corporate uh, venture and uh, the way that the corporates uh, interact with the angel-backed uh, companies and how we can perceive them as competitors and, uh, or not, as angels. Or, and how can we benefit uh, from the, the corporate? I'm in the middle of, um, of a deal uh, with uh, one of the top five uh, companies in Germany that I'm supporting is, is uh, one company that has been uh, uh, backed by angels. And um, the idea was to do a fund, a, a new round of funding for this uh, company. So um, we approached this uh, big corporate in order if they could invest 10% of the company. But now we are just discussing the value for <laughs> full acquisition from the, the corporate. So sometimes we think that we are going to talk with a corporate to invest in a, in a startup, but then they may try to acquire it, which is also really interesting. So um, in our discussion, uh, I would like to, to hear about uh, the experience of the panelists about this topic. And we will have a two-minute uh, um, uh, speech uh, uh, from each of, the, um, of the, the, the panelists here. And then we will start with uh, some questions. And uh, then we will uh, move to, to, to the audience as well. We, as we are running out of time, we will be, we'll try to be short in the answers. So um, on my right, I have uh, uh, Nikhil uh, Agarwal, senior advisor of the Federation for India Chambers of Commerce and Industry. So please give your thoughts about this uh, topic in two minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Paolo and I know each other from World Entrepreneurship Forum days. Uh, we have spent some time together. Uh, certainly a very important topic. Let me give you a little bit of my background of what my Federation and Chambers do. Uh, we are the largest and the most influential Chamber of Commerce in India with 15,000 members. And uh, mm, uh, we were founded in 1927, so it's been 90 years since the Chamber has been founded. Uh, primary responsibility of the Chamber is to bring industry together and to create a voice uh, for the policy change. So we influence uh, the policy makers the, uh, with the state governments, with the central government, uh, India is a fairly large country, as you know. And the another hat which I wear, I was still recently, I was a part of the government, so I have managed very significant government money uh, for investment. So I will try to answer uh, uh, both the side, that why the role of corporate is important in investments, and also the role of the government is played in the investment. Uh, answering the first question, it is quite tricky that why whether the, the corporate should become a venture capitalist or not. Uh, uh, the answer is yes, certainly they should. But the practical is more of a theoretical answer than practical answer. 
what happens in developing countries like India, uh, we are risk givers. We don't take much risk. Uh, like what I have seen, uh, the big corporate, like with some of the biggest corporate I'm talking about, they are as big as uh, $150 billion total turnover, but their participation and supporting with the companies at the lower level is minimal. Uh, they have created certain smaller funds and through the bankers, through the other things, like there's another example I can give you, the Reliance Industries, which is uh, the, uh, the largest company in India, they have created a billion dollar fund, but guess how many companies they have supported? Practically zero. Uh, so it is, it is the, the shift what we are seeing, the corporate money which is going uh, to the angel investment is we are not able to see much, uh, particularly in India. One of the reason is that uh, in developing countries, the structure of the startups and uh, the structure of uh, uh, the way that they are formed and that they, the exit has to happen is not very defined very clearly. Uh, Silicon Valley, we cannot equate Silicon Valley uh, with the developing country startups. They are pretty different. Uh, and you'd be surprised to know, unlike Silicon Valley, where the success rate is just uh, 7 to 10% for startups, in developing country like India, the success rate is almost 80%. Because uh, none of the investors invest in a company uh, which is going down or which is risky. So investors in India behave more like a bank than investors. And same thing is applicable uh, to the corporates. Thank you. So now we have uh, Eter uh, Jonsson from um, Copenhagen Business School. So can you give uh, your insights in this topic? No okay, hi. Uh, my name is Eitho Jonsson. Uh, for those of you who, who like football, I'm from Iceland. Which, which kind of being part of the world championship, we're really proud of that. So we start every speech like that just to get the feel-good moment, kind of saying how special we are. I work in the Nordic countries, so, so it's not really that... Uh, uh, I'm not really an academic. People uh, always kind of talk about me as an academic. Yes, I've been teaching MBAs for 15 years and at the Copenhagen Business School and at the University of Iceland. Uh, and, and teach at several other universities. But uh, I've been in entrepreneurship for 20 years uh, and uh, been part of one of the organizations which is called Seed Forum International, which is 20 years this year. And, and uh, we run uh, uh, matchmaking conferences between uh, investors and angels uh, uh, in 30 countries. So we've done a, a couple of hundred uh, uh, startups every year uh, and uh, run, probably run one of the biggest uh, databases of business angels in the world, as we like to say. But, but uh, what I'm here to talk about, uh, or, or my kind of approach to this, is around accelerators, I think. Uh, uh, I've been uh, uh, doing accelerators since 2008, uh, created several versions of those. And, and my last version, I think, is uh, interested in this context because we, uh, we created one in Denmark. And it's not like uh, uh, you might know uh, accelerators or seed accelerators, which mostly for kind of early stage startups. Uh, what we did uh, uh, this time, we created a, a, a startup for, for early growth organization or, or scale uh, companies, as, as some like to call them. Uh, and, and that is a bit uh, more challenging than, than doing an accelerator for seeds. Uh, and, and the key to that was to bring in, in stuff what we know from, from academia and MBAs mostly, uh, how can we use uh, action learning, and, and, and also from what we know from accelerators was the best stuff that we know from them, and bring that together, make a mashup uh, in effort to help uh, organizations to grow. And, and uh, my premises, the key premises was that uh, to do this, we would need corporates. We would need corporations uh, uh, both as, as investors uh, uh, and as, as channels, uh, open up the channels for these companies to be able to kind of grow internationally. And, and thirdly, we wanted them also as, as kind of spin-offs. Uh, so we thought that uh, would be a kind of a multi-level dialogue with the corporations saying, yes, uh, uh, we have a world uh, where investments in, in startups has changed and, and we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, corporations kind of uh, starting their own accelerators. Uh, uh, 
some of them just trying to understand, but, but actually what they're mostly interested in is to use Acceler to change the culture uh, within the organization. So, so that's a really interesting insight because that's not what something that I figured out before I started talking to them. Uh, uh, but it's an interesting kind of uh, 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 communication and, 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 and dialogue with corporates around this. Uh, uh, do they want to invest and why, in what organizations? Uh, do they want to spin off some of the technologies which is not uh, a core technology within the organization and therefore doesn't need to be part of the core business? And, and kind of would they like to use these uh, uh, accelerators as, as a way to explore entrepreneurship and innovation. And I, I think uh, uh, for those of you who don't understand what accelerators are, everything is, uh, everyone slams a, a label of accelerators on just about anything today. It's an incubator and it's an accelerator. Uh, an accelerator is a process. It's not a place, it's a process, short-term process, which aims to kind of uh, accelerate the growth of an organization. And, and, and key to that in, in a seed accelerator is to get funding. Uh, uh, so, so what you're trying to do is to make organization investor ready. Uh, in, in the one that we did with the growth train, it was more around how do we actually make them ready for growing. So it was less like a, a focus on the, the investor, but more focus on, on the kind of uh, the growth path of the organization. But, but uh, I think it's a, a, an ongoing uh, kind of dialogue with the, the corporates and, and, and we can talk about some of the gaps later on. Yeah, so, so one point that you mentioned is about uh, accelerators and um, some years ago the traditional way is uh, angels find uh, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs find the angels, they invest and after some years um, the entrepreneur would uh, approach the, the corporate. Nowadays because of these uh, corporate accelerators we see a lot of companies approaching the investors on the demo days of those uh, acceleration programs with the corporates already invested there. So it's a little bit a change. And of course, it comes with uh, some strings attached in terms of that, uh, that corporate. For an angel perspective, is it better to invest in a company that does not have a corporate as a shareholder or not? Because in some cases, um, in some markets, if the market is not fragmented, then if you work um, with uh, one kind of company, this kind, this, the other companies, the competitors, will not work with the startup. So in reality, you are having a corporate, but you cannot work with the rest of the market. So basically, you, are, you can only work with that corporate in, in certain markets. So is it good or bad? for an entrepreneur and for an angel investor as well to have a corporate invested in one of the startups? Uh, it depends on the product and service, I would say. Because there are certain product and services which are exclusively meant for bigger corporates. And it could be possible, for example, if you are in telecommunication and if you are supplying to uh, the Vodafone, then you don't need to go anywhere. And Vodafone is if you're an investor. Then certainly, and, but if you are an e-commerce marketplace and if you are uh, invested by a big e-commerce giant, then chances of that, that, that will not allow you to go anywhere. So it depends on the product and service. So it is the call the entrepreneur has to take, whether uh, their product or service aligns with the corporate value of the corporate investor, or there are certain entrepreneurs I know very well that they refuse to take the corporate money and they go for a much broader domain. Uh, and also, uh, the chances are that if you are taking an investment from a much broader uh, investment group, your valuation in future will go high because investors, uh, uh, the big investors, some of the PE firms are sitting here, they would like to see that what kind of interest you are able to, as somebody has said, the validation of the idea. So how much idea is your uh, idea is validated by a group of investors rather than having one investor invested in you? Yeah. And the power of bargain, of course, is different when you have just two or three investors or you have uh, 100 investors. So what's your... 
I, I also want to, uh, I mean, I think that uh, business angels haven't used Accelerator uh, in the right way. And this was one of the premises that we talked about when we were creating the growth, uh, growth train. And, and, and because in many ways, uh, a good Accelerator is a due diligence process. It's a fantastic due diligence process. If you take part from the start and as a business angel, you're involved in it. So, so, so I'm always amazed uh, uh, that business angels are not running to that Accelerator to take part in it because it's such a great due diligence process and also it's a funnel I mean we get a couple of hundreds of applications for every every round we do uh, as an accelerator so 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 we've chosen maybe 10 15 out of three four hundred so so therefore we've kind of uh, done most of the hard work for the business angels and then they can come into this and and kind of look at the uh, most interesting companies uh, that uh, or they, uh, the companies that they are most interested in and um, I always have concerns about uh, uh, these corporate accelerators and and uh, uh, Many of the entrepreneurs I know uh, kind of uh, try to uh, avoid them and especially avoid them if, if they're investing because there's a lot of liability around that and, and, and I think in the term sheet there's a lot of, lot of issues there that uh, you need to as an entrepreneur to look really carefully at because otherwise you could be locked in. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, my friend Sack, who runs Microsoft Venture, would be totally uh, disagree with me here. But, but uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, as, as uh, maybe as uh, uh, for a credibility, that if a corporation has invested in a startup, uh, that could make uh, the transition for a business angel easier, and, and, and there would be kind of. Uh, a pathway, and, and that I, I mean, that is the key thing that I wanted corporations to be involved in accelerators to open up channels. And if the, the invest in startup means that they're opening up channels, then it's interesting. Then it's uh, making, then accelerating the growth rate of the company. Then I think it's interesting. I think the, the advantage of a, a corporate for a startup is sometimes mainly access to market because they can get uh, access uh, to market and eventually some knowledge that that uh, corporate has. So my question is, um, if the main value for, from a corporate uh, point of view, compared with the, eventually an angel alone, is the access to market, is the possibility that that corporate can buy services from this uh, startup, why do corporates don't make an exchange? So instead of putting money into the company, they can say, okay, I give you an order of one million euros, and in exchange, you give me 10% of the company. And this would, would be more interesting for the startup because then they could show traction in terms of clients. But I've not seen this um, very much in the market. Um, what do you think about this model of having, uh, giving contracts, giving, buying services and, uh, from, from uh, startups in exchange of some uh, equity there? And as I've said in the beginning, theoretically it's a nice uh, uh, notion to say, but practically what happens, nobody trusts the startups. Mm -hmm. We all been working in a startup domain. Uh, the investor don't start a startup. Startup don't start, uh, trust startups. Corporate don't trust startups. <laughs> nobody wants to buy from them. You know, the startup is like a beggars in the beginning. They are going and begging the money. They are going for begging the project. They are begging for buying, selling of their products. They are begging for everything. Nobody trusts them. Now the real challenge is that people want to promote startups, but once it comes to putting the money on the table, now I wear my uh, government hat to it. We have a policy. I wrote the India's first innovation policy four years back. It's called Innovation and Startup Policy. It's a beautiful policy, if you read it. The, it's so beautiful that it is untouched. You know, it's like a Miss Universe. She looks great. And there are a number of states which have replicated this policy. There are seven states in India which has now replicated. The government of India has uh, 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 re replicated uh, part of the policy. Uh, there are two billion dollar fund the government of India has announced uh, to give it to the startups. And as we speak, after 18 months of setting up that fund, only 30 million has been dispersed. That too with the banks. Because once the startups goes and able to uh, uh, talk to the government, you know, when the bureaucrat has to sign on the paper that, okay, I'll give this money to you, that who will take the blame? Tomorrow the bureaucrat will go away, 
after few years he will come uh, be called back uh, by the federal agency that you know oh that was your niece and your the, your uh, your uncle's son or somebody you know why you are giving that money to him so that's a challenge how do you create that uh, the same challenge what we have seen in the corporate the corporate don't give uh, business to startups uh, big corporate i'm talking about i'm not talking about the small corporate uh, eventually the businesses goes to the big firms uh, so certain policy in the government what we have made which would be very interesting to follow for example we said that 20% of the projects which will be done in my state in andhra pradesh uh, will be given to the startups in uh, from the state itself 80% of the projects can go to the bigger so until unless this kind of solid policy which are uh, backing from the board and the ceo is not there the startups uh, will not able to get uh, uh, commitment either from the government also from the big corporate hitor do you want to, to jump in this topic uh, yeah i mean i i love these uh, agreements with uh, uh, big organizations and and we've done uh, several of those actually and and been, some of them been very successful and and be the basis of the organization i however discourage uh, uh, the 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 startups taking equity in these deals uh, uh, we we would rather that there is some kind of uh, uh, rights to the technology for certain of time so the organization can be a first mover and and that is very often the the argument uh, that we take with the corporates okay if you work with this startup you help them you will be the first introducing the technology and that's huge value for them uh, some percentage in a small organizations that they can't pronounce the name of is is not a huge value for organization and 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 i think also uh, one of, as i said before and this might might be changing and 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 is surprising to me at least is that uh, corporations traditionally at least the, in the world that i'm in and i'm talking nordic uh, countries context is they're more interested in 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 learning about the culture because they're trying to change the culture the, the biggest obstacle in, for innovation in large organization is the fear of mistakes and 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 i think it was in had us uh, who, who made some of these points here before i mean why why you're doing all this and 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 one of that is effect and entrepreneurs need to be fast learners, do stuff and learn from that. That is not something that organizations are good at, although they are kind of embracing lean startup stuff and like that, trying to change themselves. But they're traditionally product development is a waterfall approach, so, so they're not good at that. They don't have the passion that Hada talked about, and, and that is key to it. And, and this kind of being able to be proud of what you're doing in terms of storytelling, and, and part of that is tell tell silly stories of the mistakes. And, and that is actually a good thing in the entrepreneur world. That is a huge mistake in the corporate world and, and a bad thing for your career. So, so uh, yes, and, but for those deals that we've done, uh, really exciting and, 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 and kind of accelerated those companies. Yeah, just uh, touching here two points that uh, you mentioned um, about uh, these, uh, the problems of the, the corporate uh, that uh, when a uh, startup wants to work with uh, two different uh, corporates and it's uh, difficult to, to deal with that. Um, in my company that uh, I was one of the co-founders and we did IPO, um, we were negotiating with Vodafone to create a company with them and uh, to serve Vodafone worldwide and we managed to do that but we need to create a company, separate company with Vodafone and the people that are in that company are not in the rest of the group. So in that way, we, we managed to guarantee to Vodafone that there will not be uh, in, uh, people moving and knowledge from one side to the other. And uh, we were able, through the rest of the group, to work with other competing uh, companies um, with Vodafone. And of course, the trust is uh, very, very important to, to, to create. Um, and one of the things why corporates don't buy services from startups. I, have, I remember this story. So when, before um, we did IPO, we were not known very much. So we were around 200 people. Then we became 2,000 people in the company. And I remember a deal that IBM was competing with us for the same deal. And the IT director came to me and said, you have the best proposal. No, I have no doubt you have the best proposal. You have the best people committed to this. But, and you have the best price. It's half of IBM. But I cannot uh, give the contract to you. Why? Look, because if something goes wrong with you, 
uh, it's my fault because I was stupid, you know. How can uh, an IT director uh, give a huge contract to a, to a company like yours? So I will be fired. If I contract IBM, I can blame them and they have a huge, <laughs> huge a lot of money that we can, um, we can go against them. So I'm sorry, you are the best, you have the best product, the best team, you have everything best, but I cannot buy from you. So this is a problem. And one of the governments that I've seen that has trying, is trying to, to cover this problem is Tech as in from Finland. So they, are, they have a program that they sponsor the startups in programs with uh, big corporates. So because there are costs in terms of trying the products, etc. So they go and say, okay, if the corporate, the big corporate wants to buy a product or service from this startup, we can put 100,000 euros, whatever, in order to guarantee to the, to the corporate that they will not spend money, they won't invest money in, in, uh, without uh, a reason. So I think that's uh, just an idea. I, I found this very interesting from uh, Finland. So any question from the, um, the, the floor, any experience about uh, corporate and angel-backed uh, companies? Yeah, Candice. So, um, so first of all, I mean, as you know, when I followed your wonderful presidency at Iman, we started this e-accelerator to work, to work with the corporations. Because what you have mentioned was exactly what happened with so many startups, and it drove me absolutely crazy. Um, so in the meantime, the, there has been this report done by the Scale Up and the Scale Up Institute. And they have, and we have done a deal with them, where we really promote to corporations that they, that they must procure from startups. So not just procuring the startup, that's nice, but that they must procure from startups. And also that the governments must procure from startups, because in a way, sometimes they're even worse. Um, concerning, and, I, and this is starting to work, because it's kind of cool. Now the big corporations are saying, ah, yes, we are investing in startups, or we're giving you know, deals to startups. So the, the second thing I wanted to talk about was if a corporation, if, if, if an angel investor will invest in a company where the corporation is already there. And I personally have had this opportunity many times. I have always turned it down. Because, you know, what I want, what I want to invest, I want to invest before the corporate comes. <laughs> so just to you know, clarify two points there. Okay. Also, there is a, like what we call in US, like a Walmart or Amazon syndrome. Uh, once you are hooked up to Walmart or Amazon supply chain, uh, you cannot get out. You may, be, you may become rich. But you may not become big. Yep. Amazon would, would dis disagree with, we're working together with Amazon, and they, you know, they point to Lyft, Airbnb, a number of very, very large companies who all got started on Amazon. Oh, they'd be nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one question. Yes, uh, what do you think of, uh, about being cooperative to suppliers for big investors as a local supplier? Local cooperatives, yeah. okay, but non-profit, non-profit organizations? Indeed, somehow they are getting, earning money, but uh, producing local products. Mm -hmm. So that always happens. Uh, Cultural products. That always happens because supply chain as a, as a seller is different. Like when we talk about startup selling services uh, to a big corporate, we normally have inclination, sorry for not clarifying, towards more of a tech startup or different kind of services. But if you are a farm produce or if you are a dairy farmer and if you have a cooperative for that, uh, so certainly you have to, uh, the, whether you are a big corporate or a small uh, shop, shopkeeper, you have to buy from the farmer. And uh, that always happens. And uh, they create the group, as I understand, they create a group of uh, several such cooperative, and you have to follow a guideline for uh, quality and for a certain kind of commitment. That's what we call the Walmart syndrome. So, you know, once you start supplying in that uh, uh, line, then certainly it is possible. Uh, no question? Yeah? Yeah, what would you 
say are parameters of a good or KPIs of a good accelerator is it just the number of <coughs> sorry, startups that they get fund, or do you also look at long-term impact? And I'm asking because we see in smaller countries startups that are good at marketing might even have negative impact on the region and they hype up projects to teach them how to pitch but there's no real content behind it and then in the long term you see all these other companies following their you know example but there's it, it's a big impact and responsibility that, that accelerators have so i was just wondering uh, no, you're absolutely in a delicate matter uh, about KPIs and how to kind of calculate uh, or, or how to measure uh, or evaluate accelerators in, in general. I mean, one of the problems with accelerators is they don't have a business model even. So, so that's, a, that's the funny thing. They're teaching everyone else how to do a business model, but they don't have a business model. Uh, uh, so, so one would be that they can sustain the, the accelerator for a while. At least that would be one uh, criteria. But, but, but what traditionally has been looking at is the amount of money being generated in terms of investment, so, so that has kind of been the traditional uh, KPI, but, but more and more you're looking at, at the growth of the organization, impact investment and stuff like that. Uh, so so uh, everyone is trying to figure out uh, more variety of these KPIs to, be, to have the better measurement because traditionally they haven't, hasn't been very much. So you're absolutely right. And, and, and there might be, as you say, kind of this uh, question of hyping up some organization, not doing them very much because uh, uh, after the accelerator they tend to kind of fly off a cliff and, and, and that's not very good for the entrepreneur either. But, but uh, so, so there's a lot of work to do with the accelerators, just how they run, uh, uh, how they're organized, and also the post-accelerator kind of programs, which uh, uh, we are very kind of much focused on now because uh, I saw this way too often that after the accelerator, just the entrepreneurs stopped working because they didn't have that support that they didn't have. Then it makes no sense whatsoever. Then you're not accelerating the company. You're kind of creating a hype or a, or, or a kind of some kind a reality that doesn't exist but but I mean traditional as I said mostly funding but but that is by no means the right uh, measurement and and the only shouldn't be the only one I think uh, a, a good KPI that we of course uh, we could all agree is what uh, what is the percentage of the revenue that they acquire from startups so we can start creating this index in terms of uh, of big corporates, and of course, just for the angel community, how many companies they acquire per year from angels. That would be our <laughs> KPI, and we can then give a word for the big, uh, for the corporates that acquire more companies from the, the angel. So, um, any last uh, question, because we need to, to wrap up? No? <coughs> so, a takeaway. Your takeaway for this uh, panel, please. Uh, my takeaway, I would try to advise the, the big corporations, uh, don't be very clumsy, uh, have a big heart, uh, maybe not too big of money, but maybe a few million dollars you can put it aside. Since uh, in certain countries, for example in India, 2% of the profit has to be committed for CSR. Uh, similarly, if the government policy can come, a percent, one percent of the money can be uh, set aside for exclusively for angel investment. So certainly the reason I'm putting government again and again is that government has to play a role in guiding the corporate that your responsibility is not just only towards the planet but also towards the people uh, uh, and, in, uh, and making the entrepreneurship community more viable. So maybe my advice would be that one person of the profits that the corporates can put aside for exclusively for angel investment, then uh, there won't be any challenge on finding money uh, for many, many years to come. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I'm really interested in that uh, gap between, uh, we, we've seen that, and you know that, uh, I mean, gap between investors and entrepreneurs. Uh, there's also a gap that we've been talking about here between kind of entrepreneurs and corporates. 
and, and even, even kind of corporates and business angels as we try to make the triangulation. I, I think it's uh, uh, very important that uh, we, we try to educate uh, all, all these uh, parties to understand each other. It's mostly about understanding each other because a lot of this is based on misunderstanding. And I think, I mean, in terms of, of, of accelerators, uh, how to grow them, and in terms of how to kind of involve corporates into entrepreneurship, I think business angels can play a key role as facilitators, as kind of the people that build bridges, because they have usually the network and the experience in both worlds and, and, and are more, have a more credibility than the entrepreneurs themselves. So I think you should kind of think about it yourselves, how we can actually help to bridge this gap. And, and that would be a, a huge success if that's possible. I totally agree, and I think that we angels, we have uh, a role to play in this relationship between the startups and the corporate, uh, connecting both in an early, early stage in terms of getting clients, but also for the corporate to invest and eventually to exit. As I mentioned before, uh, sometimes we can have an early exit, a positive early exit, if we start talking with a corporate, just, oh, just invest. 10% and then they start looking to the company and they find it very, very interesting and then surprise. Oh, we were not expecting you want to buy the company, but okay, let's discuss this. So there are pros and cons working with the corporates and I think we are, the angels, we are in the best place to, to work on that uh, relationship. Thank you very much for coming and I would like to thank the panelists.